OK, ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, more of us up to work co I guess Mila Mahogut, Vartin Ass Ocht and Kura, I guess Mila Mahogut, Ass Ocht, Corla Hunde, Longford, I guess the Lower Lena, Sohunde, Ass Ocht and Kura Hunkin Kivnov. So delighted to be joining you today, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm going to talk to you about is not Longford specifically, but the um, the last days and hours of the War of Independence and some of the myth-making and propaganda that have been built up uh, around it. Next slide, Martin. Uh, so what we're going to do is basically have a very brief overview of how the truce came about. We'll look at news of how the word of the ceasefire spread to the, the combatants and an analysis of the numbers killed before the truce came in, uh, an examination of popular myths around the truce and the ceasefire, and hopefully questions if my computer still holds up. Uh, next slide, so. So basically, I suppose to outline the reasons why there was a truce in the first place, by um, there had been a possibility of a truce at the end of 1920, but the problem with it was that um, from the British side, they were imposing very harsh terms on uh, the IRA and Dáil Éireann. Lloyd George was willing to agree to a truce at Christmas of 1920, but he insisted that the IRA would have to uh, surrender its arms, uh, that captured IRA leaders, including uh, Shaw, or, you know, people later like Sean McOwen, who had been captured, that the British would be allowed to execute them after the truce, uh, that the IRA would announce a ceasefire and, on their own, and that the British would kind of respond to this. And very much what Lloyd George was seeking in December of 1920 was a surrender from the IRA. And the reason why he wasn't willing to give more generous terms was he constantly had British army generals whispering in his ear, give us one more month, give us one more month, and we will uh, we will defeat the uh can you still see me? Yeah. Hello. Can you still see me? Yes. Yeah, very good. I'll just keep speaking. Uh, give us one more month and we will uh, defeat the um, we will defeat the uh, the Republicans. So basically, uh, Lloyd George was uh, was holding out, and again, one month became two months, became three months, and ended up becoming you know seven months. And by the time of July of 1921, the uh, I'm back again. By the time of July of 1921, it, really he realised that the security forces were not going to get control of the situation. Um, also, from the Republican side, um, it had seemed that there was a clamour for peace. There was all these different local politicians and Galway County Council and the Sinn Féin TD in Wexford all issuing their own peace manoeuvres, um, but there were none coming really from the higher echelons of the IRA, and the British interpreted this as, oh, the, the Republicans are, are secretly desperate. And what happens by the summer of 1921 is the Northern Parliament is opened. That's basically taking the question of partition off the table, and the British feel that they're ready to uh, agree a truce with the IRA. And the British needed a truce from their point of view because the war was costing £20 million a year. It was increasingly popular at home and, uh, and abroad, particularly with Britain's wartime allies, the Americans, the Australians, the Canadians. And um, basically, they were, they were under pressure at home, uh, a lot of labour opposition to the war, and even the bishops of the, uh, the Church of England. So on the 8th of July 1921, uh, General Neville McCready uh, met with, uh, he was the commander of British forces in Ireland, met with de Valera and senior um, Dáil Éireann, Sinn Féin and IRA leaders in the mansion house in, uh, in Dublin. And basically at that, the a formal armistice was agreed between the British Crown forces in Ireland, the British Army and the RIC and the IRA. And uh, that was a big step for the IRA because previously the British had been referring to them as a murder gang. And now for the first time, they were referring to them in print as, quote, the Irish Army. So how news of the truce came about basically was through um, dispatches like you see here on the screen. This was the official IRA dispatch that was written by Richard Mulcahy, who was chief of staff of the IRA and was sent out to um, IRA units all over the country. So this was the uh, official way that news of the truce would be spread. We can see the next slide, Martin. Uh, you did have other local units like this one, the 1st Eastern Division of the IRA, who issued this order, and this seems to be 
pretty much unique. He says that um, uh, the divisional commander says, uh, owing to a truce that has been called at noon at Monday, uh, you will hit anywhere and everywhere you can within your area before 12 noon on Monday. The principal objective should in all cases be members of the old RIC or their barracks. All spies of whom you may already have been advised of are to be executed also before said hour on Monday. So this looks very bloodthirsty on the part of the IRA, but the reality is that in this uh, First Eastern Divisional area, not a single civilian alleged to be a British spy or not a single member of the so-called old RIC is killed by the IRA during this time period. So we have to be careful just because we find a document ordering something does not mean that that order is obeyed. Uh, if we go on to the next slide. Uh, basically the truce came as a surprise to combatants on both sides both the the ira and the british crown forces this uh, dapper looking gentleman here is douglas v duff he was a black and tan stationed in galway and he only received about 36 hours notice of the the troops so it signed on the evening of um Friday the 8th of July and this guy learns about it at 10 p.m. The, the following evening and what's happened there is he's stationed in Galway he hears about an IRA attack on a coast guard station in Clare the quickest way for him and his comrades in the black and tans to get to the rescue of the coast guard station is not to go by road because the IRA would have trenched them but to cross across Galway Bay on a boat and when he arrives at this coast guard station at Ballyvaughan in, in, in North Clare he says the following one of the wounded marines told us that they had received a wireless message that a truce had been arranged between the government and Sinn Féin and it would become operative within 48 hours. We could not believe it. So again, the ordinary British troops on the ground, guys stationed in Galway City, don't learn about the truce for a long time after it's actually uh, announced and even then they find out by accident. And the reason for this is the British do have modern telecommunications and telegraphs and so forth, but the IRA are constantly cutting and disrupting those. And there's one British unit in uh, Castletown Roach in Cork, the Buffs Regiment, and they actually learn of the troops about the same time by carrier pigeon. So that's how ad hoc news of the message spreading was. If we go to the next picture. Uh, it should be said as well that the reason for the delay between the signing of the troops on the Friday and it's coming into effect on Monday was actually based on what had happened in the First World War on the armistice of 1918. So we all know that the First World War armistice begins at 11, the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month, but it had actually been agreed six hours earlier, but both sides said we need the time to spread the word. And that's what we see here in these uh, in these accounts as well. This is Tom Barry, obviously the famous IRA leader from uh, from West Cork, and this is his account of the, the truce. I was standing on a roadside in West Cork and somebody came along and said there's a truce with the British. I've been he hearing rumours about this for the past 12 months and I didn't believe it. He thinks it's someone crying wolf. But this fellow went off and got a newspaper and said that de Valera was meeting General Neville McCready, uh, the British commander in chief. So I had to believe it then. Next slide, Martin. Um, so what you find is that a lot of IRA guys aren't receiving the official dispatch. It's basically um, uh, it's it's word of mouth in some cases. In one case in Mayo, a local IRA leader is given the dispatch. He thinks it's a practical joke and threatens to shoot uh, the messenger. But again, when he finally comes, uh, you know, and gets a hold of a newspaper, he has to believe it then. So the truce is formally agreed on the Friday, as I said, it comes into effect at 12 noon on Monday. And in the interim, 62 people died during the final days and hours of the uh, the War of Independence. Uh, many of them in the South, but a lot of activity in Belfast, which we'll come to later. Uh, next slide. So these are the 12 British soldiers that are killed um, in advance of the uh, of the in that interim period. Next slide. You have five members of the uh, the Royal Irish Constabulary, including Black and Tans. Now, one of them, temporary constable George Ad Adams, is kind of borderline. He's shot prior to the truce, but he doesn't die until about 14 months later. Officially, legally at the time, it was a year and a day, but I think really we can count him probably as uh, a truce casualty. Next slide. 
you had eight Republican combatants, uh, seven IRA and one common man. The common man woman killed was Margaret Kyo. She died in her home at Stella Gardens in Rings End in Dublin. She had actually been, um, there were British raids in the area the evening before the troops, and she had actually been hiding the ammunition, moving it from one place to uh, another, and one of the bullets fell into the fire and um, it, it went off killing her. We might mention her uh, later. Next slide. Uh, you have six civilians alleged to be spies executed by the uh, IRA in the interim between the announcement of the ceasefire and its taking effect. And again, the number of alleged spies killed in the whole conflict and those killed prior to the troops is often exaggerated. You'll see figures of 11, 12, 13 killed. It was, it was half of that number. And in fact, the IRA were holding a large number of people as spies, about eight to 12 of them, who they released unharmed at the time. Next slide. Uh, in the south, and we have to look at the south and north separately in this because the conditions in Belfast and the north were very different, but if we say outside of Belfast, you're talking about nine civilian fatalities as well, and the majority of those inflicted uh, by the British forces, like this memorial you see here is to John Foley, who was dragged out of his house by, by British soldiers, a totally innocent civilian, and shot dead. But that wasn't because of the troops, it was the kind of thing that happened throughout the War of Independence. Next slide. And Belfast Bloody Sunday will come to at the very end of the lecture that you had 22 people killed, uh, one RIC constable, 20 civilians and one IRA volunteer. Now, in Belfast modern history, that is actually the bloodiest day in um, in in that period in the, the 20th century in Belfast. Bloodier than the Bally Murphy massacre, Bloody Friday, anything like that. And again, we'll come to that in some detail towards the end. Next slide. So what we're going to look at in, in terms of those killings, we know now how many people were killed in that period, but some of the myths about those killings. Next. So this is General Neville McCready. He is the commander of the British forces in Ireland. And just three years after the truce is signed, he writes his memoir. And he says, quote, the truce will begin at 12 noon on the 11th of July, 1921, until which time the troops, whilst taking no risks, should abstain as far as possible from unnecessary activity against the rebels. And the rebels, far from imitating such chivalrous forbearance, continued their campaign of outrage and assassination until the clock stuck 12 on the 11th of July. So what he's saying is that the British were entirely noble. They immediately went to ground, didn't continue fighting. But the IRA were such a dishonorable en enemy that they were essentially murdering people for as long as they thought they could get away with it. And there were no repercussions. Next slide. But if you actually look at the breakdown of people killed, you're talking about 61 fatalities, 62 if you include Constable Adams I mentioned earlier. Of those uh, nationalists in Belfast who aren't necessarily IRA, um, some of them would be armed home rulers, ex-soldiers, but nationalists in Belfast and Republicans, the IRA, kill a combined total of um, uh, 31 or 53%, uh, whereas those killed by Belfast loyalists, some of whom would have been Ulster Special Constabulary, and by the regular British Crown Forces, you're talking about 47% of the casualties. So it's almost half and half, and we're not getting this kind of one-sided upsurge in violence by the IRA. Next slide. And so this myth of the IRA having last minute kind of uh, upsurge in violence starts with kind of Dublin Castle and British propaganda, but it later affects um, how the truce is seen and how the, the last days of the War of Independence are seen um, in the post-Civil War period. For example, this chap here obviously is um, the famous or perhaps infamous Owen O'Duffy. Uh, and he said that, quote, Kerry's entire record in the black and tan struggle consisted in shooting an unfortunate British soldier on the day of the truce. Hearing such people shout up the Republic would make a dog sick. Now, he makes this comment in 1934. He's just been to a fascist blue shirt rally, been addressing it in, uh, in Tralee. And there's anti-treaty IRA Republicans who are there basically uh, trying to break up this, this fascist meeting. And O'Duffy basically throws shade on them, saying these people didn't do any real fighting. All they did was kill one British soldier in the morning of a ceasefire. Whereas if we go to the, the next slide, uh, you actually see that the... Uh, 
IRA and Kerry had a very good fighting record. They were actually the fifth highest um, uh, in terms of uh, the county had the fifth highest number of fatalities per head of population throughout Ireland in the War of Independence. So just coming behind places like, you know, Cork, Dublin, Clare and uh, Limerick, Tipperary. Um, and you have big events like the Headford ambush, nine British army killed, the Ratmore ambush, eight RIC and Black and Tans killed. So for O'Duffy to reduce it down to saying these guys only came out fighting during the troops, that's affected. It's the same propaganda that's going going on. Next slide. And here you see the literal propaganda. This was a leaflet put out at the, the time. So this is saying it's the myth of kind of the true salir, that these guys only joined up when it was safe and like to swagger around in uniform, or they did little in the War of Independence and came out fighting in the, the last hours. So you can see an image of a guy hiding under a bed and British forces outside on the road and their crossly tenders. Here he was in 1921. Then the treaty came and now the wind of liberty blows him out and he's outside pretending to be a, a you know a, a war hero shouting up the republic uh once the, the civil war comes so these myths um as i said start as british propaganda they end up as being free state or pro-treaty propaganda and since then they've been repeated by popular historians by academics in the media uh, quite frequently and i'm sorry to say that this some of this propaganda is still out there so if we go to the next slide Uh, this is an article, for example, which was published in 1994, so on the eve of the more recent ceasefire in the north, and it's by um, Kevin Myers, who was at that time writing for the Irish Independent, and he said that, you can see the headline, troops brought bloodletting, not peace, north and south, and he mentions a lot of the killings and the myths we're going to talk about in a minute. Next slide. So Kevin Myers, again, former Irish Times, Irish Independent and Sunday Times columnist. So he had quite a, a platform and a lot more people would read his work or his writings about the, the troops than would ever sit down and read a, an academic book like mine or a popular history even. Um, but his columns on the truce, and it was something that he mentioned quite a lot um, uh, to kind of question the morality of the good old IRA and he said quote those days i.e the days before the truce were filled with bloodshed as killers embarked on a once in a lifetime summer sale of murder guaranteed without legal consequence so he's repeating the same thing that um essentially that uh, general mccready had said next slide uh owen harris again um would have some similar uh, writing styles and views to Myers. He was obviously, again, a former senator, uh, political advisor, and a Sunday Independent columnist, so had a very large media platform. And again, the truths and killings that occurred during it were, were common in, in his writings. And he said things like, quote, the IRA were in the grip of a bloodlust. So again, he reckoned that the last few killings were totally unnecessary, and it showed just how um, immoral the, the IRA were, which is the same message coming up again so if we just go on one more slide uh, I've gone into a lot of these in detail in my book Truths, Murder, Myth and the Last Days of the War of Independence, which was based on my um, PhD thesis. So I'm not going to go into all the different kind of um, myths about it, but if you are interested in them, you'll see them in this. So if we go to the next slide. So we'll look at a few different myths that are out there and we'll start with the assassination of, of RIC constables. Next. Uh, so Constable Alfred Needham. Um, Needham was a black and tan from uh, London. Now, this is not his wedding ceremony. This is the wedding ceremony of another member of the RIC. But the story goes that Needham is in, in Ennis uh, in County Clare. He hears about the announcement of the truce and he decides basically that this is an opportunity for him to wed his teenage fiance. The IRA are tipped off about the impending wedding and knowing that they can't be caught because of the truce, they shoot him dead as he exits, you know, the church ceremony, his own wedding. And some accounts say that uh, he sh the IRA shoot the bride for good measure as well, his new brand new teenage wife. Now, this is like something from a, a mafia movie or something. But the reality is that Needham was neither married nor engaged. There was no wedding ceremony. He was assassinated by the IRA, but he was shot while standing in the street. The idea of the yeah. wedding and everything is total fiction. Yeah, it actually originates. It actually originates yeah, okay, on uh, uh, 
uh, an internet website, yeah, yeah, a police yeah. history yeah. website in 1995. But the myth has repeatedly appeared in the press, history books and on TV and radio. Uh, next uh, slide. RIC Constable Alexander Clark. Now, Clark was assassinated by the IRA in Skibbereen on the morning of the, the truce. The IRA volunteers, one of the IRA officers who's involved in his assassination says that, well, Alexander Clark, as I said, some of the, um, the men who are involved in shooting him say he's quite active in intelligence, which is quite possible, but we only have their word for it. Other pl people claim that he was quite an innocent character. But again, a lot of myths build up around him. People say that he was shot whilst tending flowers in his garden. You know, and again, that creates this kind of mafia godfather style image of a killing. And he's often mourned as the uh, the last RIC constable killed. Uh, in fact, he wasn't. He was shot in the, the, the street and I think he ran into a shop. Um, the IRA, as I said, claimed that he was involved in intelligence. So it was a legitimate uh, assassination. And um, he's often held up as kind of a poster boy for those who want to commemorate the RIC as being the last RIC man killed because He's a much more likable figure than the person who is the last RIC man killed, and that's Sergeant James King, who we'll see in the next slide. Sergeant James King was from County Clare. He was assassinated by the IRA in Roscommon. And there is again a myth about his killing, that he was a Catholic on his way to mass, that he was a daily communicant, that he was a very kind of inoffensive and, and, and spiritual man. Whereas, in fact, he wasn't on his way to mass. He was on his way to the RIC barracks. Now, Sergeant King led what was known as the Castle Ray murder gang. So he had a very effective agent within the IRA. Um, he had, in fact, turned the local IRA intelligence officer. And King was able to lead raiding parties um, who uh, would capture and shoot dead, um, basically, Republicans and wanted men. So in one case, King leads a raiding party that shoots dead. Um, I think it's uh, IRA volunteer Michael Carey. Uh, on another instance, he leads the raid on the Vaughan family home. Now, this is quite brutal. Uh, he, in it, he, King and his men shoot dead IRA volunteers John Vaughan and Ned Shanahan. Uh, Vaughan's mother is obviously distraught at this. Uh, King beats her unconscious with a rifle butt. And before leaving, they shoot the family dog dead. So if you're looking at the last member of the RIC killed in the conflict and you want to promote, let's say, the commemoration of, of the RIC, um, Sergeant King is not the guy you're going to go for, even though he was the last one killed. You'll pick somebody much less offensive than Sergeant Clark, but Clark is like Sergeant Clark, but Clark is the one who's constantly mentioned on TV, radio, books, etc. Next slide. Uh, so the next picture I will warn you is uh, is quite gruesome. Um, so if you're easily offended, look away. We'll go on. Next slide. These are the bodies of four British soldiers, uh, Cam, Dacker, Morris and uh, I think it's Reynolds. I'm not sure the, the last one. They were captured by the IRA on the evening before the truce. Um, so just, you know, less than 24 hours before the war is due to end, they're captured in Cork City and they're taken out blindfolded and executed. Now, the traditional story about these guys is that all of them are unarmed, uh, that they are boy soldiers. Uh, they're, they're mere teenagers. They're out buying sweets at the time that they're, they're killed. Now, the facts of it are that, yes, they are unarmed, but these men are all in their 20s. Uh, most of them have seen service in the First World War. Uh, most of them have been wounded and gassed in that conflict. And they weren't innocents out buying sweets. They were actually uh, out drinking, the earliest accounts say, to celebrate the, the coming of the truce. Now, let's be clear, abducting four unarmed soldiers and executing them in a group execution is a war crime. There's no beating about it. But we need to put that war crime into context um, by looking at what happened the night before. And when this story about the Ellis Quarry killings appears in the media and in TV documentaries and stuff, they only mention this killing. They don't mention what happens the night before. And if we go on to the next slide, this is uh, Dennis Spriggs, who was a 20 year old IRA volunteer. He was taken from his home by the South Staffordshire Regiment of the, uh, the British Army, taken from his bed and was taken out into the street and shot dead by a Captain de Ewell. Now, de Ewell had been involved in a number of 
uh, notorious killings in Cork City, abducting um, basically prisoners, both IRA and civilians he didn't look the like of, and summarily executing them. And again, he would always have the excuse that these guys were shot trying to escape. But I mean, it's it's ridiculous to think that he captures, you know, three, four guys and they all try to escape and get shot and none of them are wounded. They all end up being shot dead. So we can see what's happening here. It's, it's summarily executing them. And the link between uh, Dennis Spriggs and what happened the following night at, um, at Ellis Quarry when the soldiers are shot is the regiment that's involved. And that regiment is the South Staffordshire Regiment. Now, the South Staffordshire Regiment had been had a very bad reputation in Ireland. They'd been responsible for the North King Street Massacre during the 1916 Rising when they killed 16 civilians. Uh, none of them appeared to have been involved in the Rising. They buried some of those bodies on, in the gardens and in the houses and tried to cover up that, uh, that massacre. As soon as they came to Cork, the South Staffordshires had shot dead an ex-British Army soldier in the city, sparking um, basically two days of rioting, during which a further three people were killed. And then, as I mentioned, Captain de Ewell is involved in these killings as well. And if we go on to the next slide, this is the person who links Dennis Spriggs and the Ellis Quarry killings. This is uh, Captain Dan Hallinan. He had been um, a good friend of Dennis Spriggs. They were both in the IRA. They were both uh, plasterers and they were both involved in the plasterers and slaters trade union in Cork. And we have documentary evidence which shows that Hallinan is the man who ordered the ex Ennis Quarry killings and two of the soldiers from the Ellis Quarry killings were members of the South Staffordshire, the same regiment that had just killed his friend the night before. So as I said, the execution of unarmed prisoners at Ellis Quarry is absolutely a war crime that should be highlighted, but so is the execution of Dennis Spriggs and the other men that Sergeant de Ewell has killed, and that's never mentioned. And we need to mention both things to put it into context. It's worth saying as well that Hallinan is uh, quite a bad egg, um, to put it mildly, uh, apart from obviously being a, a war criminal, um, he's a thief and he's entirely um, disreputable. He's actually kicked out of the IRA as a result of this um, in Cork, but he goes pro-treaty and he joins the uh, Garda Síochána. Uh, he rises to the rank of superintendent of the guards. He's based in Waterford. Um, he's kicked out of the guards for corruption, which is rare today and I'd say even rarer in 1922-23. Uh, he went back to his old job plastering and uh, he was uh, declared bankrupt he stole money and funds from the Cork Plasters Union and ended up being uh, imprisoned for that as well. Now, it's very interesting that this guy who orders the Ellis Quarry, you know, uh, shootings goes pro-treaty, but it's always brought up as an example in pro-treaty propaganda of the evil things that the supposed anti-treaty IRA were supposed to have done. Next slide. Next slide, Martin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the Kilgobnet mine disaster as well is something perfect uh, that is rarely, if ever, mentioned. Um, one little killing like, like or one killing like um, on its own, like Alfred Needham, can be blown up into this massive story about a wedding um, because it fits the narrative of IRA violence. But when it's the British who are inflicting the violence, even if there's multiple casualties, like five or six in this quite large, important incident, it never gets mentioned in those popular histories. So this is the Kilgobnet mine disaster. What happens here is it's down in, in County Waterford. The IRA, of course, would dig trenches across roads to uh, stop the, uh, the British Army moving uh, around. Um, and then the British would come along and fill in those trenches. And what happens at Kilgarnet is uh, Sean Quinn, who's an IRA volunteer, uh, gets the assistance of four civilians to help him clear out one of these trenches to reopen it that the British have filled. Now, to be clear, we don't know were these guys willing supporters of the IRA or did Sean Quinn pull a revolver on them and say, you guys are going to help me. But as they're clearing out the rubble that the British have filled into this trench, the British have placed a booby trap mine in it and it explodes, killing five civilians and one IRA volunteer. And this is something that the British are very proud of. In fact, the regimental record of the Devonshire Regiment who were responsible for this celebrate it and say, wasn't it a wonderful thing that they killed all these guys who they immediately say were all IRA, whereas in fact only one of them was. Next slide. Next slide, Martin. 
Thank you. Uh, so the uh, spies and, um, and informers is quite a controversial one. And it's often said that the IRA would execute a large number of, let's say, Protestant loyalists as spies, and that this was a cloak of convenience for sectarian killings. But again, I look at in my book how about three quarters of those killed by the IRA as alleged spies during the, uh, the War of Independence were in fact Catholics. And if you look at the shooting of, um, let's say, John Poynton, who shot before the truce in Leash, um, it's often said that, oh, he was a, a poor Protestant farmer who was, who was, you know, taken out because it was a sectarian killing. And people never mentioned the fact that John Poynton had actually served in the Black and Tans and had boasted that he was going to get all the local IRA men locked up. So this is, um, a label that was on the body of a spy who was shot in uh, in Mallow, uh, Alexander McPherson. Uh, and this again is often cited as a case where, oh, the IRA shot him because they knew the truce was coming. In fact, he was shot a day before the truce was even agreed. It's just that his body was found after the ceasefire hit the press. So people immediately put two and two together and make five and assume that it's um, uh, uh, a result of the political development. Next slide. And this is Major G.B. O'Connor. He was a Protestant Unionist, uh, quite a, a prominent Unionist in Cork. He'd run for election on a number of occasions, was actually a historian as well. But he had testified at the court martial of IRA volunteers in Cork City who were sentenced to death. He had been giving information to the, um, the British forces. And we know this because Josephine Marchant Brown, who was an IRA mole in Victoria Barracks, was copying all the information he was sending in and she was sending it back out to the IRA. So the IRA had a mole at the very heart of British intelligence in Cork, and that's how they identified this guy. But again, when you see his killing reported as a pre-truce killing, it's just, oh, they took out an 80-year-old man and they shot him because they knew the truce was coming. And the fact that they had information about him for months beforehand is, is never mentioned. Next slide. And this is Bridget Dillon. Um, now, the IRA make an attempt uh, to shoot Bridget Dillon's brothers, who it's pretty clear had been giving um, information to the British Army. And they lived at Kilcash in Tipperary. Uh, their father uh, was uh, an ex-RIC constable. Uh, Bridget Dillon was, I think, 14 or 15 years old. So this is a contemporary picture of her at the time. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see her house. Um, the IRA basically wanted to capture the brothers, take them out because they had very solid evidence that they were um, they were spying. This is the house in Kilcash in Tipperary. And if you can see just over the door, there's a, a small window there. That's where it now bricked up. That's where Bridget Dillon was, uh, was shot. And what happened was the IRA went down, surrounded the house. The Dillon family, quite understandably, weren't going to let them in and have their, their sons taken away and shot. So basically a standoff ensues and when the IRA tried to force their way in, the Dillon family, you know, throw vases and pots and pans and whatever they have trying to, to defend themselves. And Bridget Dillon is, is upstairs at that window. And as she is standing there looking out, the father, uh, I think Ma Martin or Michael Dillon, uh, throws a vase, it smashes. And when the IRA hear this bang, they assume that somebody's opened fire on them. They fire into the window and one of the IRA volunteers with a uh, shotgun uh, hits Bridget Dillon in the head and fatally wounds her. They still take out the brothers intending on executing them. Um, but what happens is that in the confusion and the botched nature of it, the brothers escape. The one of them is later abducted during the truce and executed by the IRA as a, a spy. Next uh, slide. Um, so we'll go on again. Next slide. Uh, so Sergeant Charles Mears and uh, Hannah Carey are the last two people who are killed in the uh, War of Independence. We'll go on again. And this is, I think, uh, an image of uh, Sergeant Mears' grave. He is Charles Edward Mears. He's shot by the IRA in High Street in Killarney at 11.45 a.m. on Monday, the 11th of July. So this is the British soldier that Owen O'Duffy has been talk talking about in his kind of fascist anti-republican propaganda and he says or he's buried in the um, commonwealth war graves um, cemetery in the uh, section in the city of london cemetery what happened here is that 
Kerry Republicans get the blame, but it appears that it's actually Cork IRA volunteers who are kind of holidaying in Killarney or have gone in there from North Cork to celebrate the truce. They see Charles Mears coming down the, the town with another British Army NCO and they open fire and they, they shoot them. And again, that's that is a case where, you know, it's an opportunistic last minute thing, but that could have happened at any time in the War of Independence. And if we go on to the next slide, we'll see where Hannah Carey was shot. Now, how the British react to this is they come out in their uh, in their Crossley tender lorries. Um, uh, we'll just get the next slide. I think I'll show you one of those lorries. Uh, the British come out in their crossly tender lorries like this one. They're quite heavily armed and they're so annoyed by the shooting of mirrors that they race through the streets and they open fire on uh, civilians in all directions. Now, the IRA operation is they arrive, they shoot them and they disappear. This isn't an ambush or a long running gun battle, but the British go completely wild in Killarney afterwards. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I think this is College Street in Killarney which is uh, adjoining High Street where Sergeant Mears was killed. Uh, on the, in the background on the left, that white building was the Imperial Hotel in Killarney. And it's there Hannah Carey, who's a 46 year old um, maid, was, uh, was shot dead by one of these passing British patrols. She was doing some cleaning at the front of the hotel at the time. Now, she shot at 11.50 a.m., so just 10 minutes before the, uh, the truce is due to come into effect. And she is officially the last casualty of the War of Independence in the South at any way. Things as we'll see in a minute when we finish up are different in Belfast. It's undoubted that she is shot by uh, an RIC constable. The British Army investigation into this, the constable you know, confesses to shooting her but claims it was an accident. But that doesn't stop again, the propaganda machine. Dublin Castle issue a press statement saying that she had been shot by the IRA, even though they knew the British were responsible. Next slide. So the last thing we're going to come to is the Raglan Street ambush and Belfast Bloody Sunday. Uh, I've tackled, we'll stick with this slide, I've tackled a lot of um, uh, kind of anti-IRA, pro-British myths. Here's a Republican myth that's worth tackling as well. This is uh, Roger McCorley's account of the Raglan Street ambush. And he said, I had issued an order that where reprisal gangs were concerned, no prisoners to be taken. The enemy offered to surrender, uh, but my men stuck to the order. They refused to accept it. The fight continued for 45 minutes and the last of the reprisal gang was wiped out. Now, this again is, is a totally, you know, devoid of the reality of what happened. What happens in this ambush is the British forces who were unhappy with the announcement of the truce and the fact that coincidentally two of their comrades had died, um, who had been wounded a few days earlier, died that afternoon, went to Raglan Street in Belfast, roughly where the Falls Road, Divis Flats are now, and they decided they would raid the home of a local IRA intelligence officer and take him out and shoot him. The IRA saw the British lorry coming. They opened fire. They just killed one RIC constable, who we'll talk about in a minute. But by the time Roger McCorley is talking to the Bureau of Military History, he said there's this British reprisal gang come into the, the area, and uh, he claims that they, they wipe them all out and they kill about 12 of them. This is not, not what happens, but he wants to create a myth that the IRA in Belfast had ambushes as big as those that happened in uh, in Cork or uh, or elsewhere, and uh, basically, um, this is, is total fiction. This is is not what what happens. So we'll go on to the next slide and describe what actually happens. Is that when this reprisal gang comes in, the IRA inflict one fatality, and that's a guy called Thomas Conlon, shown here. He is a Catholic from Roscommon. He had actually been working for. The, uh, the IRA giving them intelligence information and tip-ups about these kind of raids. So it was very much an own goal for the IRA. But by the time McCorley is finished telling the story, he fabricates this you know, thing that makes the local Belfast IRA look very good. So you've 20 civilians and um, one IRA volunteer killed in the riots that follow. So if you go on to the next slide. Um, so this is, uh, just to finish up, this is uh, the... Um, cartoon that's in the Leinster Leader at the time, and it's entitled Southern Truce and Northern Truculence. And you can see here on the uh, one side, you have uh, people in the south at the beach and they're reading the paper and enjoying a July holiday. Uh, whereas in Belfast, it's, you know, murder and arson and, and things are crazy. And in a way, that is what, how the, the truce took hold. 
because if you look at between the announcement of this ceasefire and the uh, and the signing of the treaty, I think there's another there's another 60 people killed, even though they're supposed to be at peace. And the vast majority of these happen not just in the north, but in Belfast. And why there was such a reaction to the truce in Belfast, and it's the one area where there is definitely a kind of uh, a response to it that isn't based on this propaganda, um, is that um, uh, there were very high tensions always before the 12th of July. And remember, the truce is coming in on the, the 11th of July, which is the night that you have the bonfires and everything. Uh, the unionists basically feel that they are being sold out. Why is the British government having an official ceasefire with the IRA? The British must be about to desert us. Um, the B specials, the Royal Irish Constabulary, were not seen as being a very loyal police force in, in Belfast because they said that there were too many Southern Catholics in it. The B specials, the Ulster Special Constabulary, were seen by the Protestant loyalists community as being their police force. And one of the, th the, uh, the conditions of the troops is that the B-specials were actually being disarmed and sent home from their barracks. And this obviously got unionists very, very worried. So a lot of tension about that. And also as well, I mentioned nationalists killing people in that rioting. The IRA were a very small organization in, in, in Belfast at the time. I mean, the largest armed group of Catholics in um, Catholic nationalists in Belfast would actually have been ex-soldiers, home rulers who were loyal to uh, John Devlin and the old Home Rule Party, the Irish Parliamentary Party. Many of them were members of the ancient order of Hibernians, who essentially were, were green orange men. And some of them were involved in sectarian attacks on, um, on Protestants and the burning down of Protestant loyalist businesses. And sometimes the IRA intervened to stop them doing this. And you have cases in the north, which doesn't really happen in the south, but Hibernians and ex British ex-soldiers, Catholic ex-soldiers, um, drawing guns on the IRA and then killing each other, executing each other as spies and so on. So that's why the situation in Belfast is a lot more tense and complex than in the south.